Boom. All right. Everything should be. Boom. All right. Now enter full screen. All right. We should be live. Let me just check. Take off my glasses. There's such a bad glare with this thing with my glasses. <laughs> All right. That's a. Uh, All right. All right, we're live. What is going on, everybody? Uh, Teal Nation podcast is the first person in the building. I know being the first comment is pretty important around here, uh, so he's the first. Uh, let me uh, let me do split this screen a little bit. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, man, we can't see you, man. What the heck? Yeah, I'm no, say, no one's trying to see me. <laughs> you're you're big and you're big and zoomed in right now, man. I'm trying to see if I can. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, whatever. I'll try. I'll try a little later. Let me try. It. Let me try to zoom in. My there we go. All right, I'm big now. <laughs> All right, cool. So what is up, everybody? We got 38 people in here. Uh, four on, four off. Duval till I die. Yarence, Bacon Boy, Giovanni, Alex Beach, Robert, Aspect, Teal Nation, Michael Sachs Jr., Rise, Kevin Cronin. What is going on, everybody? So today in the building we have. Uh, Jason. Last time I had Jason on, he was Jason from another Jags podcast. Now he's Jason from Jags United. So uh, what's going on, Jason? Uh, tell us a little bit about this whole rebrand you're going through and what kind of stuff you're offering to Jags fans now. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, we uh, started out as just a podcast and there was like uh, three other guys and we just kind of did it for fun as a side hobby. Um, and then it kind of started taking off and then... Um, some of the guys had to start doing other things with life. And um, so then it kind of turned into just me and one other guy. And then we kind of got the itch to start branching out from podcasts to YouTube videos to articles. And um, uh, we got some cool things coming this month. I mean, we're really in the beginning stages of everything. Uh, we just kicked it off like a couple weeks ago. But um, in, in a couple weeks, the website's going to have apparel. A message board because um, you know we need a we need a new Jags message board that Jags fans can go on and really uh, talk some stuff up. But um, man, it's all kind of uh, all kind of stuff for fans to get involved. So you, you know it's JagsUnited.com or you can just check out the YouTube channel or uh, the Twitter. The Twitter is where we pop off. So either way, nice. So you guys are probably going to do a bunch of videos, podcast apparels, and basically covering pretty much everything, right? Yeah, I mean, really, we wanted to branch into uh, writing articles and things like that. And um, it's hard to do that with the podcast name. So as much as everyone loved the name Another Jags Podcast, you know, in order to to grow, we had to kind of rebrand a little bit. Yeah, it's got to be a little bit tough because you kind of build this whole entire brand. And then it's like, all right, guys, this is what we are now. You know, I'm sure a lot of people that are following you on Twitter are all of a sudden like Jags United. Like, what is, what is, what is this that I'm following? Yeah, I had a uh, I had a good buddy. Uh, I was hanging out with him, and he was looking through his Twitter, and he's like, "Who the hell is Jags United?" And I was like, "Dude, that's literally me." <laughs> he's like, "Oh crap!" <laughs> like he had no clue, so it was like pretty funny. Yeah, uh, pretty funny thing. That's good stuff. But yeah, man. So uh, last time I had Jason on a pot on the on a live stream, it was right before the NFL draft, and we were kind of previewing the draft and uh, going over all different types of scenarios and stuff, and. Uh, now that the draft is over, you know, we are, we drafted, we used all 12 draft picks. We didn't move around at all. Uh, so what are some of your thoughts about just this draft class in general? Well, the big thing that stood out to me was uh, that Dave Caldwell used most of the draft picks to retool the defense. Um, he had a, a good defense in 2017 that was athletic and fast. And since then, they haven't really had much of a defense. So, I mean, taking uh, Henderson and um, Kalevon chase on in the first round, I think was a statement to the fans, the team, the organization that uh, this team is going to be built through the defense and we're going to get athletes on defense and um, we're going to plug in pieces where we can on offense. But we're he wants to kind of retool the entire defense, which is an interesting strategy. Um, so we'll see how it pans out, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's it was kind of tough for fans because I know a lot of fans are saying, oh my God, we need left tackle, we need wide receiver, we need, we need to help out Gardner Minshew. But 
you know, and I can understand that perspective, but you also look at it from the other end. And, you know, do, these people that really wanted to go a bunch of offense, they can't deny that our defense needed help too. So it was kind of about prioritizing, like, what you wanted. And I guess, um, you know, who knows? They might not have gone in there necessarily wanting to go defense, defense, defense type of thing. They might have said, uh, look, these, this is our board. We went by our board, and uh, this is kind of what we came up with. But uh, I mean, when you when you look at it, like I agree with you, getting 12 picks, like using all 12 picks, I did not think that was a possibility. The Jaguars did go out there and do that, and uh, really, it, if you look at the if you look at the way we drafted, I mean, we drafted guys like with our first four picks, you know, the first two in the first round and second and third. We drafted players that are going to contribute like right away, like uh, you know, C.J. Henderson. He's going to be a plug and play cornerback one. Uh, you got Chase on, who's obviously, you know, these def- defensive ends are always in under rotation. Uh, you know, you got LaVisca Chenault, who's definitely going in, to be in the wide receiver miss, you know, mix. And then you have defensive tackle Devon Hamilton. So, like, all these guys are going to have day one impact. So, it, it's good in the sense that, you know, the Jaguars really are trying to win right away because I know there's a lot of speculation on what they're really trying to do. You know, I think at the end of the day, they're going to try to win. But, uh, you know, we got a bunch of pieces that uh, kind of prove that, you know, maybe the Jaguars are trying to win right now. Yeah, it's weird because um, a corner, I mean, that helps you immediately. But, I mean, one corner, I mean, that upgrades your defense. But how many wins does one corner really translate to? I mean, we see bad teams all the time with an outstanding defensive back. So, I'm not sure how many wins one corner gives you immediately. Kalevon Chason is is kind of a gadget edge player. I mean, he's all speed. I mean, he's very strong and he's very athletic, but uh, he's he doesn't seem to me like right now he's an every down guy. Down the road, he may be when he puts some weight on and things like that. But right now, for next season, to me, he seems like a guy that comes on the field on passing downs and gets sacks. Um, so how big of a help is that? Uh, LaVisca Chenault, I mean, He's looking at being maybe wide receiver three right now. Um, does that help Minshew a lot? Probably, but not as much as like a wide receiver two would. Um, and Devon Hamilton is going to be a rotation guy. So I, I I don't know how much they're trying to win next year. You know, this was a this was these are good picks for the future and you know rebuilding the defense. But I think they kind of have their eye on twenty twenty one. I mean, just think if they trade in Gakwe for a first round pick, they could draft a quarterback a receiver and a, or they could draft a quarterback, a receiver and a tackle all in the first round in 2021. So that could be the year they kind of go after the offense. And it's, it's fascinating to me because like, I think the the Jaguars, I mean, they're going to try their best to win in 2020. And uh, it's just weird because you look at it and say like Dave Caldwell is literally going to be able to tear this team down, rebuild it all back up to where, you know, you have this team full of pro bowlers and then just steep decline, and then you're able to kind of trash it and redo it. And I guess Tom Coughlin kind of gave gave them some time because I guess all the blame got kind of put on Tom Coughlin. But, I mean, it's really amazing that Dave Caldwell and even, like, Doug Rohn, that they've just been given these second chances. And I guess I just look at it, and I, like, I, th- I look at Chad Khan, and I think of him as a guy that's a great businessman. And, you know, a lot of people are hard on Chad Khan just because, you know, the guy is a horrible the guy just doesn't know football at the end of the day. And, you know, he doesn't make great decisions to really help out the football team. But, uh, you know, and then, and then you look at it and, like, it's almost like he's going with his heart saying, okay, I'm going to retain these guys as I have good relationships with Dave Caldwell. And, you know, Doug Rohn seems to be a good guy. Like, I just, you know, like, Shad Khan, like, he's good in business. But, man, like... Him, when it comes to the football aspect, like I think that he's been kind of a big reason why we've been having repeated double-digit lost seasons. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine why these guys have been around for so long. I mean, never in NFL history has someone gotten seven years, you know, and not produced anything. Um, my only thought process or rationale that they have is Dave Caldwell, I think, is pretty well respected amongst GM circles. Like, uh, when they're in Indianapolis at the Combine, when they're at these coaches' meetings, like Dave Caldwell has a really good reputation as a GM. Although it doesn't translate to wins, I think that good reputation has gotten him all these years. Um, Dave Caldwell, look, I think if it wasn't for bringing in 
uh, Jay Gruden and bringing in um, Ben McAdoo, I think Marone would be out of a job. But I think those guys came in, and it's kind of like a it's kind of like a head head coach former All Star team, you know, kind of. And so I think that's these they're unusual circumstances that have helped these guys keep their job. And that's me just grasping at reasons for why these guys have gotten so long because it makes no sense. Yeah. So I, I was curious, like, what do you think about this whole because. I think like last this the last week I've just heard so much discussion on Twitter about like Gardner Minshew and you know I think there's this debate about whether he's like overrated or whether he's underrated or um, you know whether he's really the guy that will be able to kind of uh, lead this team and you know like I think Gardner Minshew like I think he can be pretty good but you know I'm not I'm not necessarily 100% sold on him but you know, I think that if he's a first round pick, like, you know, because everyone's kind of saying Kyler Murray, he's going to be a great thing. Daniel Jones, he's going to be a great thing. You know, both those guys are first round picks. But, you know, Gardner Minshew had just as good of a year, if not better than those two guys. And, you know, I think just the whole six round pick thing behind him is kind of, uh, you know, is the reason why people aren't um, thinking he's like better than he is, but like, what are your whole like thoughts of like Gardner Minshew? And you know, do you think that uh, you know he's earned his spot in 2020? And like, how do you feel about him going forward? Yeah, I mean, I've saw that debate, and I was reluctant to get involved because I don't like to get into like debates and stuff on Twitter. Um, but then I had to jump in, and not not for any reason that I think that he's not overrated or that he's underrated. It's that he hasn't gotten a fair evaluation either way. He was been brought in as a sixth round rookie, started the season as the backup, worked with the second team all off season, got thrown in because of an injury, had an abysmal offense around him. I mean, the highest PFF grades on the team are like Brandon Linder at a 75, which is horrible for I mean, that's your highest graded player. And you can say what you want about PFF, but that just gives you kind of a benchmark and uh, DJ Chark, Gardner Minshew are the next two on the list. So, that shows you that those two guys were the entire offense. And how can you call a quarterback overrated or underrated based off of that? You have to give him another year. He's earned at least one more year. And the way the quarterback situation kind of uh, unfolded this year with all the free agents that there were and the draft class being like pretty weak outside of Burrow, um, it was a great year to give Minshew another chance. So I think everything aligned to give Minshew the shot next year. I like how they brought in Mike Glennon instead of Cam Newton. Uh, because there's no controversy on who's the starter um, and give give Minshew a fair shot. I mean, you can look at stats. You can look at all the analytics. I mean, we watched all the games. Eyeball test is that Gardner Minshew is at least an above average quarterback. So you got to at least give him a shot with a, a, some semblance of an offense around him. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's earned it. And right now it's the jury's still out on whether he's overrated or underrated. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely agree with you there just because, like, I mean, he's done enough to get a second chance because the Jaguars last year were pretty abysmal. But, like, when you, but, but when you look at it, Gardner Minshew was, like, 6-6 six and six as a starter. I mean, that's pretty unbelievable. And, you know, I think one thing that he did really well was I think that, like, he really, like, you know, helped DJ Chark to the level that he came to because, you know, one thing about DJ Chark is, like, you know, he is a number one wide receiver and – Gardner Minshew just fed him the ball. I mean, he said, look, like, I'm going to throw it to your back shoulder. I'm going to give it to you at 50-50, you know, shots. And I'm going to let you get, you battle it out, you know, with the cornerback. And that's what he did so many times. And, you know, DJ Chark just did some fantastic things last year. And, you know, like you said, like, I think 2020 is a big-time evaluation year. You know, let's see what we have in Gardner Minshew. And uh, because he is an extreme unknown. You know, I wouldn't feel good about saying, okay, Let's let's bring in Cam Newton and you know he'll he'll you know competition have a competition with Gardner Minshew because first of all like there's really no such thing as quarterback competitions in in like the NFL I mean you just don't get enough reps it's not it's not high school where you know all these guys get level playing fields and then they're all going to go out there and kind of compete like this is you know you need to use your practice time. And the amount of like, you know, scrimmage snaps that you can like at your, you know, for, you know, the most productive way you can, because teams don't have two, three days anymore. You know, the, the, you know, the players union, you know, decided like in a CBA, like they, they have certain limitations. So 
Um, and I don't think that the fact that like I hate when people say, "Oh, bring in this guy because he's gonna mentor him." Like, like what's he gonna do? Whisper sweet things in his ear and <laughs> have him go out there? Like, I just I, I don't I don't agree any more with a mentor as I do like you know what's the difference between having a mentor backup quarterback and and the quarterbacks coach? The quarterbacks coach is the mentor. The offense exactly. coordinator is the mentor. We have Ben McAdoo, former head coach. Jay Gruden, former head coach. And I don't know. I just I just think with Minshew, let's ride with him. We did get him some more weapons when it comes to LaVisca Chenault. And, you know, we got Tyler Eifert in there. And hopefully, I mean, Tyler Eifert, you know, you can talk all about his injuries. But, you know, when, if he's completely healthy, like he's one of the best tight ends the Jaguars have ever had. And, you know, we'll see what we have out of Josh Oliver. And then obviously James O'Shaughnessy's back. But, you know, we did give uh, Garner Minshew a little bit of help. Um I mean, the help that he did get, though, they are used to being a little bit injury prone. But, you know, I'm willing to see what we have at a Gardner Minshew in hell. Like, like some some teams that make these Super Bowl runs capitalize on quarterbacks having cheap rookie contracts. That's what the Rams had in Jared Goff and went to the Super Bowl in 2018. That's what, uh, you know, that's what just this last year uh, the Chiefs had in Patrick Mahomes having him on a cheap contract. And, I mean, you look at the Rams now, they're totally going downhill after paying Jared Goff as like the richest quarterback in the NFL you know you saw similar things with Carson Wentz and the Eagles so really I mean if he can be the guy I mean we got you know 2021 and 2022 where like Gardner Minshew's on like this cheap rookie contract uh, another thing that I think fans are going to be interested in this year is the difference between how the offense looks between Jay Gruden and how it looks with John D. Filippo. John D. Filippo is one of the most random offensive coordinators I've ever seen. Though his play calling is is just makes no sense. I mean, you remember when, you know, that we had like 30 pass plays in a row. And it was just like like it makes sometimes it just makes no sense on what we're doing. What Jay Gruden does is he I mean, everything's short, quick, three step drop, get rid of the ball. If it's anything more than a three step drop, it's a play action bootleg, which fits Minshew's play style perfectly. And it's a bunch of inside zone running the ball up the middle, basically. Uh, which Fournette is pretty good at. So um, if, if the offensive line, I, for, the, for the entire offense, the entire hinge is going to be on the offensive line. Uh, what are they going to be? Because like you said, Chark is a wide receiver one. He's good. Chenault, if he stays healthy, great wide receiver three. D.D. Westbrook, I think is going to surprise people. Keelan Cole actually actually graded out pretty well last year. I mean, didn't put up the monster stats, but he graded out pretty decent. Chris Conley, uh, the slant route master. I mean, he, he runs a perfect slant route. So I, the weapons are there. Um, like you said, Tyler Eifert, who, you know, I will mention last year was the first time in his career that he played like all 16 games. And it was interesting was that he was the wide, he was the tight end two and he lined up as a receiver almost every single snap. So it'll be interesting to see if the Jags do the same thing. Um, I bet they will. So you can expect to see Eifert as more in the slot receiver role or lined up and stand up next to the line of scrimmage, which Jay Gruden likes to do. A lot, but it, it for me, it all is going to hinge on those five guys up front. Um, Juwan Taylor improving next year, them figuring out the right guard situation between Can and Richardson, uh, Linder getting up there, but still a good player. Norwell trying to work out whatever he's got going on, and can Cam Robinson bounce back from a second from an injury two years ago? I think that's going to be the big swing point. Yeah, and they really didn't give Gardner Minshew like much help along the offensive line. I mean. <laughs> We'll see if Ben Bart can come in there and do anything, but you know I'm not going to say that this offensive line is much improved because we got Ben Bart in the fourth round. So no, absolutely not. So yeah. I don't know. And one thing I did notice, you know, I was following you on Twitter a little bit today, and like you've been doing some reviews of kind of Jay Gruden's offense with the Washington Redskins. What are some characteristics that you've seen out of him? Okay, so um, my goal is to get through all 16 games, the first drive of the game and the first drive of the second half. And I'm logging it uh, by formation, by wide receiver formation, by play, by play, like what the actual play is and things like that. Um, and his tendencies are definitely starting to show. I'm through like six games right now. Um, he, his favorite formation is what's called ace 11 formation. And that basically means quarterback under center, one tight end, one running back, but he likes to keep his receivers tight. So he likes to keep them like really tight to the line of scrimmage to where a lot of times um, there's a lot of room next to the boundaries for like outs and corners and speed outs and bootlegs and things like that. So um, 
in, in his favorite run plays, that inside zone, basically give it to Fournette, let him run between the guards and uh, try to get three to five yards just to kind of keep the line of scrimmage moving. So uh, be expecting a lot tighter formations, um, less receivers, um, maybe just two receivers on each play. Um, he likes to use one tight end as a blocker and one tight end as kind of like a could be a blocker, could be a receiver. You don't know on any given play. Um, so a lot of, that's what you can expect a lot. He, do, he really doesn't go to gun or empty unless it's like an obvious passing down, like third and medium, third and long. He likes to keep the defense close to the line of scrimmage. And one thing that he also likes to do is on the first play of every game, he loves to bomb it deep. And and keep in mind, I mean, he was using like uh, Case Keenum last year, Colt McCoy, and then Dwayne Haskins, who are all, I think, all marginal quarterbacks. First play of the game, bombs every single time. <laughs> it, it's it's going to be interesting to see how it works out. Yeah, I know. Uh, but what, one thing that I do want to touch on is that the schedule actually recently came out. And, you know, I was kind of looking at it and – one thing that's pretty interesting is I think that the Jaguars could potentially come out to maybe a quick start because, like, I mean, I look at it in the first seven weeks, the Jaguars are most likely playing rookie quarterbacks with Joe Burrow, Tua Tonga Viola, and, and Justin Herbert. And, like, I'm wondering if, you know, no one knows how this offseason is going to be going when it comes to, like, what kind of practices are going to be going on. And, like, we could be going in a situation where we're playing like rookie quarterbacks in the first, you know, three of the first seven weeks with limited practice time. So, um, like, what do you, what do you think? Like, do you think the Jaguar schedule, like, do you think it's favorable? And like, what, I mean, like, I guess, what are your overall thoughts of when the schedule did come out? Well, I mean, one of the benefits of being the last place team in the co conference, the year, or the, the division the year before is that you get to play a last place schedule the next year. Um, which is nice. Um, I, I think I think Burrow's going to be a good quarterback. I, I think that Bagels can come out here and beat us because um, – and we're playing at Cincinnati. I mean, that's – Burrow's a good quarterback, man. I mean, that guy is good. And that's like one of the only guys I would have traded up for this year's draft was Burrow, Chase Young, or, or Isaiah Simmons. Those are the only guys I would have traded up for. Um, I think Burrow's going to surprise some people on how quickly he adjusts to the game because his college film last year was some of the best college film from a quarterback I've ever seen, and I've been watching football for a long time. Um, the throws he made um, were just amazing. I mean, coming out of the gate with the Colts, with Phillip Rivers, I mean, that's got to be a loss, right? I mean, I'm, I'm a big Jags homer, but, I mean, that's a pretty solid team. I mean, they got their eyes on, like, a deep playoff run this year. Uh, Titans, they have their quarterback. They got a good offense. Um, yeah, you're right. Tua, you don't know what, what you can expect out of Tua. Is Tua even going to be the starter day one? I mean, those are all questions. The schedule looks favorable. Um, I hate going out to L.A. I hate going to Green Bay. Um, I hate going to Minnesota. I mean, those are tough. All those are tough games uh, to do. But um, overall, uh, I think we're at a six to eight win team with this schedule, in, in, in my opinion. Yeah, like, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking like five and 11, six and 10. I hate to say it. And, you know, a lot of people like get on me for being negative. But I mean, I'm just, I, I'm not going to be a sunshine pumper. You know, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of tell it how it is, but it's funny. You, you made, you made mention of the, you know, week one matchup against the Colts. It's, it's funny because, uh, Phillip Rivers has been the Jaguars killer. I mean, the Jaguars, I think have only beat him once and the Jaguars have just been horrible against him. But you also combine that against the Colts at home and the Colts haven't beat the Jaguars at home since 2014, like the very first game where Blake Bortles ever got any action. So, you know, I wonder which side that kind of um, leans toward. But, I mean, really when I look at the AFC South, I mean, it, it really does look like it's up for grabs, especially, you know, when, you, when you've taken the Jaguars out of it. You know, it's really hard to pinpoint who's going to be the best team between the Colts, Texans, and Titans. You know, obviously Titans just came off an AFC Championship game. The As long as the Texans, as long as, long as they have Deshaun Watson – they're going to be a really tough team to beat. They're almost like the Seahawks out there where Seahawks had bad rosters, but they have Russell Wilson, so they're able to win games. And yeah. then obviously the Colts, you know, they got the Forrest Buckner and they had they had a pretty decent draft. I mean, they, you know, they got the USC wide receiver in the second round and then it went and got Jonathan Taylor. So, I mean, uh, it's 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 going to be tough with the AFC South. Like, what are, what are your kind of your overall thoughts about the division? Yeah, I mean, I think the AFC South is one of the best divisions in football. I mean, we don't have to look any further than last year when both the Titans and the Texans made pretty decent runs in the playoffs. I mean, that's two teams in the AFC South. Uh, a lot of divisions can't claim that. 
Titans, you can call it whatever you want. Luck uh, got Derrick Henry got hot. But at the end of the day, I mean, they got the AFC Championship game. Um, like you said, Texans, Deshaun Watson. I mean, Bill O'Brien's going to have an offense. I mean, that's what you know. I mean, he's going to every single year. And, and the Colts, I mean, those draft picks you mentioned, Michael Pittman Jr., uh, uh, Jonathan Taylor, those are guys that are going to help the Colts like this year. And they're going to help them. I mean, long term, you know, maybe – trading up for a running back in the second round isn't a great idea, but for next year, it's going to help them. So I think the Colts have their eyes set on 2020. Phillip Rivers obviously is a huge upgrade at quarterback. Um, and I think that there's three teams in that division, not named the Jaguars that could be in the AFC championship game. And I mean that seriously. So um, maybe that's what Dave Caldwell's thinking. Maybe he's thinking this isn't the year to try to make a run because um, all three of the teams are pretty much trying to make a run this year. And that's never a good, that's always a great year to tank. Let me just put it that way. And I'm not a big fan of tanking. I don't think the players are ever try to tank, but the front office can definitely put a subpar quality team on the field every week, which they've done in the past. So, yeah. And it sucks because, you know, when I was coming out with my mouth and I was basically saying like, Oh, when you take the Jaguars out, you know, look at Colts, Titans and Texans, they can all really all be number one. I'm like, Damn, that just realized that, like, are the Jaguars, how come, like, it just sucks how, like, you know, there's three teams really in the mix, but it just doesn't feel like the Jaguars are really, like, in it, and it, it just, it sucks to say, and, like, I'm, I'm just, I'm, like, so tired of just all this, all this losing, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everyone is, but, um, look, it's, I, I think it's a rebuild year. Um, I think Minshew can be the guy going forward. Look, if the Jags win eight games this year and then they draft a tackle in the draft next year um they bring in a free agent wide receiver to pair up with chark i mean now you're looking at a team that can make a run i mean i i think we're an off i think we're a couple offensive linemen and a wide receiver away from being um competitive in this division um but look that can happen in a year i mean especially with the way they're structuring these contracts and bringing in new free agents and um norwell taking you know helping the team out restructuring his deal um, things like that. I mean, you could definitely see this team within a year, which is not a very long rebuild, being just right up there in the conversation. And I've got a question for you. Who do you think we will get a higher pick, the Jaguars or the Rams? Like, what pick do you think is going to be higher for us? Um, honestly, I think the Jags will. And I know people like to clown on the Rams, and I'm right there with you because there's a lot of reasons to clown on the Rams. But the Rams are, I mean, we don't, I mean, they're, they're a pretty decent team. I mean, Jared Goff is, I know everyone wants to discount him as being terrible. He could very well be, but I mean, with the weapons they have up there, um, it's going to be hard for them to be worse than a seven to eight win team. Um, they have a pretty tough, tough schedule, but you just look at who they have. I mean, I love their draft pick of Cam Akers. I thought that was a huge steal of a pick, and I think he's going to help that team out immediately, replacing Todd Gurley. Um, the defense is stacked. Uh, that's a team that I think does better next year than they did this year. Um, but, um, look, you can use two picks. I mean, look, if they're in the top 20, they're going to be good players. So as long as they are two picks in the top 20, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. See, I, I, like, I think the Rams pick might be higher just because, I mean, when I look at it, man, they're like, their schedule is just so hard. I mean, within the division, they have this, you know, the NFC champs, the 49ers, the Seahawks go ten and six every year. Then the the Cardinals with Kyler Murray and DeAndre Hopkins, like you know, that's that's you know six really tough games right there. Then uh, I think they're playing like the uh, they might be playing the I, I, I forget I forget which division they're playing, but I mean I just it just it just looks tough for me. And you know I don't know what real direction they're taking. They didn't really do much to fix the offensive line, and that was a huge issue last year. Um, I don't agree with using their very first pick in a draft on a running back. I mean, I like Cam Akers, but uh, you know, I'm, I, I'd rather build the trenches up before I'm investing in uh, in getting running backs. I mean, they just let Todd Gurley go. They, I think, they invested like a third or fourth round pick in Hender and Darrell Henderson last year. So I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't feel comfortable with the direction that they're taking, and then. Um, you know, obviously they're whole, so tied up in their payroll with like Jared Goff, you know, being so rich and they've lost some veterans with Clay Matthews and Eric Weddle out there. And I mean, right now, like, they, like I think they haven't even, they're, they're owe a bunch of players money is from what I'm hearing. So I don't know, like it just, the, the team, the team sketches me out and I really, um, I don't know, like obviously Aaron Donald's a great player and, 
Uh, you know, they got rid of they got rid of Brandon Cooks. I just I just don't really know the real direction that that team is taking. Yeah, I mean, they have a bunch of talented players, but like you said, they don't really have a real direction. The the thing about contracts and being like what people call like salary cap hell is that the these NFL execs are very smart and they know how to front load most of these deals. Basically, what that means is if your team's in quote unquote cap hell, it's only for a year max two. I mean, look at the Jags last year. We were in salary cap hell last year. I mean, we had the thinnest cap margins and we had yet to put pay Jalen Ramsey, Miles Jack, and Yannick Ngakwe. And look at us now. I mean. Yeah, we got rid of all those players and we're going to. But, I mean, we're next year, we we're, don't have any cap issues at all. So the cap issues aren't as big of a deal um, as I think some people think as far as that goes. But you are right. They did lose a lot of veterans. Um, their schedule is hard. I think they're playing the AFC East this year. Um, you know, Patriots, Dolphins, Jets. I mean, who knows how they'll be, um, Bills. But um, I think that when it comes down to it, it's – it's really going to come down to how Jared Goff plays. Um, I know people are, like I said, whatever about Jared Goff, but would it really surprise anybody if he came back and had a decent year next year? I mean, he's one of the highest paid quarterbacks in football. It wouldn't be that surprising. Yeah. So I, I did, you know, you did mention Cam Akers earlier, and I'm not going to lie. Like when I was sitting there watching a draft, I was just, I got a little bit, I, I don't know. I got a little bit salty when I kept seeing like Cam Akers go out the board, like Jonathan Taylor went out the board, like JK Dobbins went to the Ravens and, uh, I don't know about you, but like, were you? How are you feeling that the Jaguars really did not get like, you know, a handful of, you know, at least one out of these handful of, you know, really good draftable running backs out here? Um, I'm okay with it, um, only because I think they kind of had their, they kind of already had their eyes set on Chris Thompson, who Jay Gruden loves and was very effective in that Redskins offense last year. I mean, he wasn't the number one running back, but. He was so effective on pass downs. I mean, just the screens, the dump downs, the flares. I mean, he was a he was a really really solid player um, that could play you know third downs and passing downs. And look, if they keep Fournette, I like Fournette. I mean, his he didn't grade out great, sixty five on PFF, not a great grading, and he's really not a great pass blocker either. But I mean, his effort last year was there. I mean, he kind of carried the team in the passing game. I think he led the team in receptions. Uh, I mean, I, I'm okay with the Fournette, Chris Thompson combo as long as they can both stay healthy. I mean, that's always the asterisk, the kicker is can both guys stay healthy? Because if one, I mean, if Fournette goes down, which he has a history of being injured, now we're looking at Chris Thompson and Raquel Armstead as your two running backs. And then now you're looking at an offense that pretty much has no rushing attack at all between the tackles. Um, and that can really stunt Gardner Minshew. That can really hurt the tackles when now – these ends don't have to worry about playing the run. They can just get after the quarterback. So, uh, look, every team takes that risk when you only have one power back and one receiving back. But I'm okay with those two guys. Yeah. So I did want to give some quick shout-outs, man. We got 82 people watching. If you guys haven't already, man, drop a, drop a like on the stream for me, man. It really helps me out. And also, you guys can follow Jason at Jaguars United. I dropped the link to his Twitter account down below as well as uh, the website for his new uh, for the Jags United webpage. So, you know, bookmark that on Google Chrome, Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge, whatever, whatever people are using nowadays. And, you know, of course, down below, you can also follow me on all my social media. Um, you can purchase merchandise and become a member of the channel. So, um, yeah, and, you know, I did want to continue on the running back thing. Uh, like, I... Like, it, it did kind of suck for me to see these guys go by, but at the end of the day, I think in 2020, the Jaguars will probably just run Fournette into the ground. They're probably not going to give him another contract, and they'll probably draft a guy in 2021 in the second or third round and pretty much do the same thing, just use and recycle. Like, I don't believe in paying running backs, and I also don't really agree with drafting running backs, like, in the first round or whatever, uh, but... Like, you know, I look at it and like you can you can draft running backs pretty much wherever. And, um, you know, a lot of these guys turn out pretty good. So, I mean, I think after having Fournette, I just kind of realized, man, I'm not going to be drafting any more running backs in the first round. Like, I love, you know, the kind of effort that Leonard Fournette does bring in. But, um, you know, I would like to keep drafting guys in the second, third round and uh, and hope they at least play on Fournette's level. The reason why I wouldn't draft a player in the first round anymore is just because, 
you know, when I drafted Leonard Fournette, I was really wanting, and I say this a lot, and I hate to say it, but I was wanting, like, Fred Taylor, Maurice Jones, Drew, and I didn't get, you know, he's definitely, like, a tier below that, you know, if not even more, and I don't know, I'm just, um, but I I think, and, and another good thing about drafting running backs is, you know, rookie running backs, like, of all positions for players who transition from college into the NFL, it's the easiest for running back positions, in my opinion, just because it's all instinctual, you know, you know, you take the ball down and there's not a lot of thinking. You're just going with, you know, you're going with like whatever your instinct is. And, you know, you just have to kind of go in there and teach them, you know, maybe some pass blocking or, uh, or, you know, picking up blitzes or route running. So I don't know, like, I I just think that we'll be able to find a decent guy in like next year's draft and kind of roll with it from there. Yeah, I mean, I think the way the NFL is headed, being a passing league, a scoring league, that the position of running back is going to evolve into a couple different positions. I think you have your 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 power backs that will pick up third and one, fourth and one, um, and you know, even on first down, will get you three to five yards, which really helps your offense. Second and five is so much better than second and ten. I mean, it's a huge, huge difference uh, between those two downs. Then you have your receiving backs who can get the ball in space and make plays with the ball in their hands. And then you have the rare guys that can do both. Um, Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley. If you get a rare combination of a guy that can do both, I could justify drafting that guy in the first round. And I think that's what people wanted Fournette to be, and he just hasn't been. But you're telling me you wouldn't draft Christian McCaffrey in the first round? I mean, that dude, it's because he does everything. That's the thing. He's not a traditional running back. He does it all. Yeah, I mean, when he put – I mean – I did kind of forget about that. I mean, Christian McCaffrey, like, if you can get a guy that not only helps out in the run game, but also pass game, and a guy that, like, I mean, he, it just seems like to me, like, you know, Fournette and Christian McCaffrey, they've been in the league for, you know, the same amount of years, but it just seems like Christian McCaffrey is so much crisper than Fournette. Mm-hmm. It just seems like Fournette, it's almost like, you know, the tires have been used more, and they probably had the same amount of touches. I don't know. It just seems like, you know, something's a little bit different with Christian McCaffrey where, you know, he keeps really good shape, you know, he keeps really good care of his body and he's just, he's still, he's still quick and, you know, he can still do a lot of things. I mean, running between the tackle, um, he's a great receiving back. If you guys had him in fantasy, you know, all the fantasy footballers <laughs> know how good he was. And yep. even though a Jaguar fan, that guy destroyed the Jaguars. Yes, like he, did. he had, didn't he have like over 200 yards rushing? Yeah, I think all purpose he was close to 300. I mean, he, he's a beast, man. I mean, he's I mean, we'll see. I mean, the, I guess the big test will be his longevity, how long he lasts in the league. Um, Saquon Barkley, another guy. But here's the thing about Saquon Barkley and Christian McCaffrey, and this kind of goes back to your point. McCaffrey and Barkley are both on really, really bad teams, and they were unable to get their teams to the playoffs by themselves. So. Are they worth a first round pick? That could be your argument there uh, if, you're, if you're playing devil's advocate. Yeah, and quick quick shout out to January Man with the five dollar donation. He says, "Keep up the great work, Duval." Hey, thank you, thank you for the donation, man. And um, we have a couple of people. They're kind of asking about DeAndre Swift. It's kind of interesting when I looked at kind of where the running backs went in this draft. I mean, uh, like a lot of teams, like it wasn't it wasn't like they were getting a lot of these good running backs were getting drafted to teams that had you know, big holes at running back. I mean, DeAndre Swift, he got drafted to Detroit. You know, they have on Johnson. You know, J.K. Dobbins, he got drafted to the Ravens. They have Mark Ingram and, and Justice Hill. And, uh, you know, you, you had – I feel like I had, we had some guys get drafted to teams already with running backs. And, you know, you look at Marlon Mack with Jonathan Taylor. So, um, it's really looking like the NFL is going – is moving toward, like, a real one-two punch – uh, which, like I said, I was just talking about fantasy. It's annoying as hell when you're a <laughs> fantasy owner and you're trying to like decide where the hell you draft these guys. And you know, I remember last year I drafted like David Montgomery in like the third round, and that was that was horrible. So I mean, like that that's really where the NFL is going toward, man. Is is these is these uh you know these one two kind of punch running backs? So I mean, uh, would you prefer like this kind of method, or would you rather have a you know, Ezekiel Elliott, Saquon Barkley, someone like that to really carry the load. Man, I mean, if, if, if I'm picking, I'm taking Elliott, Barkley, those guys. Um, I don't, I, McCaffrey, for sure, because those guys are, I mean, you can build your offenses around those guys. 
Um, but those guys are rare and they're hard to find. And if you miss on a guy like that, it's a huge miss um, for sure. Um, so I think a lot of teams go safe with the running back. The biggest issue for me running backs is the running back position. They get injured so much. So if you're really counting on it, I mean, Zeke Elliott has been so fortunate not to be injured. Fournette hasn't been so lucky. I mean, would they be similar type backs if Fournette didn't have the extensive injury history that he's had? I mean, and then Zeke has somehow escaped all injuries. So injuries are just the biggest concern. I mean, we talked about uh, the Colts uh, drafting the back from Wisconsin, uh, Jonathan Taylor. He has he had three thousand. He had I'm sorry, three hundred carries in his three years at at Wisconsin. I mean, that is a lot of carries. Uh, in a season, yeah, 3, that's, what's so, weird. that's 3, what's so weird about like, like Travis Etienne went back to Clemson. Like, why? Like, yeah. you're you're a running back. Like, you're just gonna put mileage on you. Then, like, look at the NFL how it works. Like, running backs have very short lifespans. Running backs are getting drafted later and later, and running backs don't get big contracts. That just that blew my mind that he went back to school. Yeah, well, maybe he's hoping he can be a. McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara type that can play in the receiving game too because ETN's a very talented back. And Dabo Sweeney is such a great recruiter that he just gets those guys to get bought in. And they're, I mean, those guys buy into that guy. I don't know how he does it, uh, but he does it. I mean, I guess, I guess if he wants to come back and like, you know, he knows how good his chances are at winning a championship. And, you know, many, most college players, I mean, you know, especially in college, these guys aren't winning a lot of national championships unless you go to LSU, Auburn, or Clemson. But um, you know, you know, sometimes you go to the NFL and you turn out like Paul Puzlesny, where you're just on bad, you're a great player on bad teams, and you don't get close to the Super Bowl. So you know, maybe he just he just is hungry for the championships. I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to win to be on a like a national championship Super Bowl team. I just can't imagine that feeling because I know as a I know as like a fan, you know, I've never you know I've never like, you know, Jaguars never won a Super Bowl. Uh, you know, UCF hasn't really won a national championship. Oh, be careful there. Be careful. That's some touchy touchy ground there. Hey, I like I like to troll people about it. I have a UCF <laughs> national championship shirt, but uh, you know, I can't uh, you know, I mean, I think it was, I it, was, it was a decent move to go out there and say it because, you know, it actually kind of got their name out there and I don't know, but we didn't, UCF didn't actually win. I'll, I'll say that, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, if you're on it, I can't imagine that feeling and maybe he's just hungry for that. You know I mean? Maybe, maybe he's worried he's going to get drafted to, uh, the Browns or the Jaguars and, you know, not be able to sniff that kind of success. But that was, that, that was just, that was just really weird to me. Yeah, I mean, and not to mention the guys like the Jags have gotten in later rounds because of their injuries there last year. I mean, Miles Jack was super was injured. If it wasn't for the injury, he probably would have been a first round pick. Marquise Lee would have been a first round pick if it wasn't for the injury. I mean, coming back your senior year can really cost you a lot of money. Um, so he must have some high values and character traits if he's willing to risk millions of dollars on a national championship, which is really worthless as far as dollars and cents go um but hey you know some guys are just wired differently and, and maybe it's always been a dream like you said to win a college football championship who knows i just i just don't know how much going back is going to improve his draft stock you know like how much more are we gonna how are we gonna figure out about him rarely does going back to school help your draft stock i mean i'll just i mean i'll say it i mean it, it, it happens from time to time but uh very rare i mean joe burrow um he didn't really choose to go back, but I mean, his draft stock between the last two years skyrocketed. But I mean, look at uh, CJ Henderson. Dude, C- 2018 CJ Henderson is is a top five pick. 2019 CJ Henderson, mm, maybe a late first round pick. So you average that together, he went ninth. You know, so it's like, does does your last year in college, does staying another year really? I mean, look at Tebow. I mean, Tebow. <laughs> I mean, he still got drafted in the first round, but man, his junior year. When he won the national championship, if he would have came out that year in the draft, he probably would have been a top ten pick. Yeah. So I want to I want to kind of uh, go a different direction here, just kind of talk about the NFL draft. And like when I look at it, like I think the most exciting player that we drafted, in my opinion, is uh, Clavon Chason because like I look at this guy and like you know this guy, you know, he's not he's not the best build, I guess, for a defensive end because he's a little bit lighter. But this guy is 
has really good like technique. Like this guy, like getting off the line of scrimmage and his bend around the edge and you know his stunt moves that he does and hell, even his like spin move. I mean, I remember whenever I think of spin move, I think of like Dante Fowler when we drafted him in the top five. Then like he's just literally doing spin moves into nobody. I mean, you know this guy like. When you look at kind of, I think where he is like technique wise, like you know, there's guys like there, there's guys like Kinlaw who got drafted like you know above him, you know, just because like oh this guy's a big body, this guy's great potential. But you know, there's also guys like Chase on that kind of fall a little bit. But you know, they have a lot of stuff that you want when it comes to uh, the kind of tools that a pass rusher has. So you know, I know you did a recent film review on. Clave on chase on like what are some of your thoughts about this guy yeah i mean everything you said was spot on i mean what the big the most surprising thing is he was only a starter in lsu's defense for one year uh, he didn't start playing football till like halfway through high school i mean he got offered at an lsu camp as a sophomore in high school basically based off his athleticism alone um he still has a lot to learn and coaches in the nfl were probably very wide-eyed at that opportunity to coach him to do things like you said his spin move is deadly um his he's he is so fast i mean dante, dante fowler was a great comparison dante fowler was drafted um because of mostly his athleticism in college um and he's turned out to be a pretty good pro and he's developed some moves and things like that kalevon chasen is so fast that when the ball is snapped the tackle that's blocking him will kick step like really far into the backfield in anticipation of his speed move like that's how fast he is one of the fastest dns i've ever seen more of an edge player than a dn um because of that it allows him to spin it allows him to work back inside allows him to stunt and he basically on pass downs he's going to be the jaguars most dangerous player on pass downs i i mentioned to see a couple times um in the georgia game he didn't have a great game i mean he went against two nfl tackles in that game andrew thomas on one side and uh, the right tackle got drafted by the Colts. Uh, his name escapes me, but um, two NFL tackles, and he didn't have a great game. He kind of got pushed into the ground, um, kind of uh, eliminated until the very end of the game. Um, and but he's young, and he's learning everything, but he is probably my favorite player on the Jags right now just because of his athleticism. So athletic, so obnoxiously fast and strong, pound for pound, probably the most athletic guy on our team. Yeah, and you know, you do mention that he kind of disappeared against Alabama, and there, you know, it's not a big red flag because there are players that I mean, you said Georgia, but there are players that get, you know, you know, top drafted players that do sometimes disappear on tape. Like I remember looking at Derek Brown against Auburn. I mean, he kind of got pushed around against Auburn. Granted, he was going against, um, you know, a future NFL guard, but you know that tends to happen. But you know, I, I also want to talk about the draft because I know you know you came on my show a couple days before. Uh, the NFL draft and you know you talked about how you really wanted Isaiah Simmons like how heartbroken were you when he got, went right before the Jaguars picked I mean I was bummed about that but to be honest Kalevon Chasen is a lot like Isaiah Simmons I mean he played the exact same role at LSU that that Simmons played at Clemson so I mean they're a lot of the same player Clemson I think or uh, Simmons is a little bit more polished been playing longer um, but Kalevon Chasen is honestly the next best thing. And I wouldn't have known that until I watched the film on him. Very similar players. I'm very happy with that pick. It's funny because I actually mentioned to you in our live stream, I was like, look out for Kalevon Chasen, man. He could be he could be a pretty good pick at number 20. And then I was I like, remember that. we that was got a good him. Call. Man, yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, so I was uh, I was pretty excited about it. I mean, I remember just uh like I remember just doing my live reactions because I just remember I was like, okay, like you know the the Panthers on the board at number seven. Like we have, to, we're gonna wind up with at least Derek Brown, Isaiah Simmons, and then boom, boom, they both just went. Yeah. I was just kind of like, all right, we got C.J. Henderson, whatever. Then we kept seeing like C.D. Lamb fall, and then he got drafted. So it was like, okay, like you know, I just remember, I just remember just being like, you know, we could have, we almost came away with like you know Derek Brown and. Uh, you know, Derek Brown or Isaiah Simmons and CD Lamb. But I mean, I'm good. I'm good with what the Jaguars did in the first round. You know, we've got some, you know, guys that will make some good impact year one. And then, uh, you know, we got some real positions, you know, real valuable positions. You know, cornerback is a very important position. Uh, so is defensive end, two, probably the two most important positions in the, you know, in the 
really in the NFL on defense. So I don't know, man. It's uh, it'll be exciting. I mean, this this training camp, whatever it's like, uh, I imagine. Unfortunately, we're not going to be the general public will not be a lot of training camps just with you know the latest pandemic going on. But hopefully, we get to see these guys like you know maybe they'll live stream a little bit of it maybe at the end when they do 11 on 11s we'll be able to see a little bit of that so we get some kind of access but i'm just one thing that we're missing is when you get to see the new players your new rookies inside of the helmets and practice jerseys i don't know that always that always hypes me up a little bit yeah for sure um, i'm i'm always i always love to see uh new blood on the field and you know i i'm one of those i mean i i don't say i don't think i would say i pump sunshine and rainbows but I get overly excited about players when we draft them, but I mean, I'll admit it. You know, I got teal tinted glasses on most of the time. I, I, you know, I want to hear your thoughts. What are your thoughts on what do you think Josh Allen will do this year? What do you think? I mean, it's his second year. Um, the defense apparently is going to look different with a position now that he's used to playing. Um, how do you think he looks in year two? I think he's going to excel in year two. I mean, we'll see. We'll see how many more double teams he gets because obviously, you know, last year he was playing with Calais Campbell and Andy Ngakwe. So, you know, he was almost the third guy to look at when it comes to that. And now he will be the premier guy out there. But, I mean, with he's got an amazing worth ethic. And, you know, he doesn't have a lot of distractions. Like, you know, I go... Uh, you can you look at him and you know he's got a wife he's got two kids and you know I saw him like a couple days after Clavon Chase on you know he's out there on a FaceTime call with them talking about getting to work talking about you know just all this stuff and like he just he exemplifies everything that you want in a first round pick and you know this is a guy that comes right after all the Jalen Ramsey drama you know right in the middle of all the Yannick Ngakwe tweeting and stuff like that so I mean, really, the sky is the limit for a guy like him, and um, I've got, I've got, I've got really high expectations for him, and I really think that he is, um, you know, him and Gardner Minshew at the moment are pretty much the the faces like of this Jaguar team. Absolutely, I mean, just having him being able to um, basically with the hybrid defense, allowing him to move out basically to what's called the nine technique, where you're thinking about the line of scrimmage it's the outside shoulder of the tight end being able to line up there every single snap will give him such an advantage um to to play the run or the pass and man i think i think him and ronnie harrison are going to benefit the most from this new defense because they're going back to their more natural positions that they're more comfortable and skill set kind of tends to do yeah i mean i'm excited to see this new defense obviously uh I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to retain Todd Wash, but I mean, I mean, we we have him. I mean, he has done some interesting things when it comes to figure out how to like rush the passer. Um, my, it, it just it does it just does suck though because like I really wish Janik Ngakwe wasn't you know on you know feeling that type of way and doing all the stuff that he does because I would just be you know chopping out the bits if I saw you know Chase on Josh Allen and Janik Ngakwe you know, on this team, because I mean, you know, if we would, if we could have been able to pay in Gakwe, then like, you know, you've got, you've got a pretty good disposal of, you know, defensive end slash like outside linebackers for you. Yeah. I was disappointed to see what happened with in I mean, a player that the Jags fans loves. I mean, the dude could have been a legend here in Jacksonville, but that doesn't matter to the players as much as it would matter to like us. I mean, these guys are chasing paychecks. They know their life expectancy and their career expectancy is short playing in the NFL. Um, I get it. He could have definitely handled it better. Um, but it's just sad to see because, you know, when we, were, we we had debates for years, I mean, our podcast was known for a long time as the Dante Fowler versus Ngakwe podcast because there was two of us that were in huge favor of keeping Dante Fowler and two of us that were in favor of keeping Ngakwe. And it just went back and forth and Gakwe kind of emerged as the better player. Um, but man, you wonder what would happen with a guy, like you said, that was all in on this franchise and that wanted to be here. Um, it seems to me and Gakwe is chasing a big market. He's chasing stardom. He saw what uh, Jalen Ramsey did. And he's like, that seems like a better option than staying here and losing with this team. That was probably his mindset, unfortunately. 
I, I just wish like we knew, like who is Ngakwe mad at? Like is he is he like butthurt about anything that Tom Coughlin said? Like you know Tom Coughlin's out of there. Is he upset with like Dave Caldwell? Like he 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 went at Tony Khan on Twitter and like you know I would rather him just say because I think he went on he went on some kind of like NFL Network ESPN type of thing and just said you know. My time with the organization is done. You know, I moved forward and uh, I'm I'm moving on to the next team. It's like, what? Can you tell us like what happened? Like, can you give us some insight as to like, you know, is it because they lowballed you and gave you this type of deal when he thought you're worth this? Is it? What is it? You know, I've I've I have no no idea what it is. If I had to guess what it is and i'm just like kind of reading the tea leaves here but to me this kind of seems like what it is and i would be willing to bet a substantial amount of money on this theory i think in wants to be in a big market i think he wants to be in new york he wants to be in la chicago he wants to be somewhere where he's the headline where he's the in the newspapers on the websites and he's the guy in a big city and jacksonville unfortunately is one of the smallest markets and so his attempt to get out of jacksonville he's using the front office as a scapegoat because the rumors that the Jags offered him between 18 and 20 million is probably very generous compared to what he would get on the open market. I mean, look what Clowney can't even get a job. So I think that he wanted to get out of Jacksonville, but you can't come out and say, I hate the city of Jacksonville. I want to go to a big market. That seems very selfish. So I think he just used the front office as a scapegoat. And that's the only rational way to act like the way he's acted um, for these last couple of months. And I mean, I could definitely see that because you look at him and like, uh, because Jalen Ramsey, when he got drafted to the Jaguars, he was already a big thing. And then, you know, he already had all his followers. Everybody knew Jalen Ramsey. And, you know, he was really able to become the face of uh, the Jaguars. And then this most recent year, you see the Jaguars draft Josh Allen. Everybody already knows who Josh Allen is. And, you know, he gets sent to a Pro Bowl. Something that Josh, or the Unique Ngakwe, I think, has only been to, like, one one of. And uh, Unique Ngakwe, one thing, a couple things that aren't helping him is that you know, he's not a super vocal guy. Um, he didn't come from a very, like, well-known school. He was a third-round pick, and just his name, Unique Ngakwe, is not, <laughs> like, a easy name. It's not a, you know, it's not a really cool name. So, like, his name is always kind of hidden in there. And I think a lot of people, I mean, if you follow football closely, obviously you knew about him with the 20, you know, after the 2017 season with his strip sacks and stuff. But, you know, the casual, the casual NFL fan – you know, I don't think has really heard about him until, you know, their team was rumored to trade for him. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I could definitely see that maybe he wants to be in a big market because that might be really his only way of truly getting his name out there. Yeah. And and, and I would be willing to bet that's the case. Um, and I get it. You know, when you're a kid and you're growing up, you, you know, you always vision yourself playing, you know, and being known and being on Sports Center. And the bottom line is, the national media does not really put a lot of attention to Jacksonville. So unless you're a loud mouth Jalen Ramsey, that's one of the best players at your position or whether you're Gardner Minshew, that can kind of be sensational. You're not going to get talked about in Jacksonville and that, but that just comes with winning. You know, if you lose that winning and losing, it kind of comes with that 2017. I mean, 2017, Barry church looked like a pro bowler. So, I mean, are we going to really judge 2017 in Gakwe to, to be fair? Because literally everyone on that 2017 defense looked like was like the best year of all of their careers. Um, minus maybe Clayus Campbell, who had an even better 2018. And somehow. it's funny because these, the defensive backs like Barry Church didn't find a job after that. Aaron Colvin, like Aaron Colvin fell so far yes. off the cliff, man. Like he, yeah. had, he had a bad year with the Texans. And then he had like a bad game with them the year after. And they were just done with him. They, they literally just cut him like the day after a game. So... <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, it, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I think Deshaun Gibson just got signed by the Bears like last week. So, and obviously A.J. Boye has never returned to that form. So, it was a, I mean, looking back on it, what a what a weird year it was for the Jaguars. A great year, but it was a weird year. Yeah, all excited. But, I mean, I don't think any player has replicated that production since then. So, yeah. We'll see what happens. But yeah, man, we're I'm probably we're about to be on for about an hour. So we got a hundred people in here, man. Uh, thanks yes, everybody for being in here, man. Definitely, if you haven't already, drop a like on a stream. Also follow, um, you know, Jason down at Jaguars United right down below. I forgot the link to his YouTube channel. That sucks, but uh, you know, I can go it's ahead. All and, good. <laughs> I usually I, I usually got, put all the all the tags in there, but. You know, I'll go ahead. I got, and, a, uh, I got a big bump last time I was on your channel, so uh, I know I, I saw that. that. I saw you gain a bunch <laughs> of uh, 
I was like, there we go. So he's at 562. Maybe right now I'm gonna drop his. I'm gonna drop the link to his channel down below. Let's see if we can bump him up to about a uh, to about I think what 600. What did I just say you were at? Uh, yeah, 600 sounds great. Yeah, 600, man. Let's get into a thousand so we can start. Uh, <laughs> so we can start monetizing, man. Get there we guy, go. Now we're get, talking. Get, get get this man some monetization. <laughs> But yeah, other than that, man, we got, uh, you know, I've got his links, his Twitter down below. Also, bookmarkjagsunited.com um, for, you know, future blog posts, apparel, all of different type of stuff. And you can also follow me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at UCF underscore Jaguar. You can become a member of the channel and purchase merch and the links down below. But, um, you know, Jason, got, got, any last, got any last words before you head out? Nah, man, just, hey, man, I love being on your channel. I appreciate it. Anytime you have an open slot, hit me up. You know I'm down to come on and talk some Jags. Sounds good, man. But, hey, guys, thanks, everyone, so much for uh, joining. And I will see you guys all in my next stream.